Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Prime Revision Network. Today, we're going to cover the EIA. We have a lot of uh, new data that came out, uh, good and bad, in terms of where things are. And obviously, we had a, a, a really big build in, uh, in crude, but then we did have that offsetting large draw in gasoline and a pretty sizable drawdown in distillate as well. But we'll go through that in pieces. And then when we look to Asia, things in Asia continue to weaken, which is you know putting those headwinds onto US exports and some of the different uh, you know backdrops of where things are going to go in general. So before we get into just the EIA numbers, we just want to give a, a quick high level of kind of where we sit today as we go into what should be a fairly normal uh, turnaround season in the US and Europe, just because a lot of these assets have been down, but we should see an accelerated turnaround season in Asia, which is something that we're going to cover in, uh, in a moment. So just looking at the, the WTI crude curve here, you can see that the white line is that was uh, is demarking 55, and you can just you know get an idea that you can everything up until about January 2023 is trading above 55. So even though we're in this pretty steep backwardation, you can still get a fairly sizable uh, hedge on you know depending on which month that you're in, what you're targeting, and then that red line is is uh, is showing where that 50 is. So you can see that we're starting to get a little bit closer to 50, but then again, most people aren't really looking at hedging 2027, but just kind of give you an idea of where things sit. We're starting to get a little bit of a, a crossover when you look at that green, uh, the green curve, which is two weeks ago, getting some of that pressure later on in the curve. But again, the curve is really not predictive. It's just where are you trying to model out where you think your returns will be if you're if you're going to start investing in long uh, long dated projects. But that's why it's good to look at. But again. <laughs> It's not something that's predictive. Like we've shown time and time again that it's just something to watch. You know, the one that's the most important, I would say, is the whether, you know, 18 to 24 months, because that's really where it's the most liquid. You can get some some uh, decent sized hedges depending on who you are, what you're trying to accomplish. So that's where we keep looking at to see where uh, can companies get their protection. And then is that going to support additional production growth as we go through the, re the remainder of uh, 2021 and into 2022? So just a, a quick backstop before we go into uh, China briefly. We just wanted to look at, you know, what are some of the changes? This was, I thought, a really good um, uh, uh, picture that was that was done by Reuters. And I just wanted to show, you know, I, I think it kind of covers where we are year over year in terms of uh, crude and product. So when you start averaging everything together to understand and really kind of pick up where those changes are, because I think it's important to appreciate crude and products when you th when you're thinking about the two of them together. So when we look at um, at Europe or the ARA, you can see that we're still uh, up year over year, you know, the same can be said pretty much across the board, except when we start going into um, Singapore, when we start going into Fujara, Fujara had another good number, which we'll which we'll talk about in the third segment. And then when we start looking at east of Suez, you can see that we're starting to get some positive news, which will start to reverse a bit just based on the amount of production or uh, movements that we're, that we're seeing in terms of where the east of Suez really is going uh, based on some of that Asian data and some of the flows coming into the U.S. But in general, you can see kind of where things sit on a year over, year over year level with crude, week over week with crude. Obviously the US having these big builds due to the downtime of refiners is accelerating that and that's something that will normalize. But it again, it, as that normalizes, then you'll start to get an adjustment in products. So that's why, you know, something that we've said from the very beginning, you have to weigh the two sides because they are, you know, two sides of the same coin. And and that's that's why people were, were fighting us when we were saying that we were going to see big builds in, in crude just because refiners went down and that's your biggest buyer of oil. So as they go down, then more oil gets put into storage and more uh, product gets pulled out of storage because they're not making new products. So again, these are things that we have to look at. But as we go forward, we will start to see some normalization as additional refining capacity comes back. 
Now, when we look at China's planned refinery maintenance, you can see the elevated nature going into 2021, which I think is an important piece of why did OPEC do what they did. And when you start looking at 2021, you can see March and April and even into May that we're going to be pretty well over the 2021 downtime, which again is going to is going to impact their import demand cycle and why they're really not buying all that much now because they do have new crude that's showing up. You know, demand is going to fall as it started to in February and March, which again we'll talk about in the last segment which is going to be a net headwind on demand in the near term, specifically into China, and obviously they're the largest buyer, so that'll put pressure on Asia in general. And then that's when, why when we start looking at floating storage, you can see that we had a, a pretty big spike in floating storage, but there's also some delays at the port where typically it was taking about eight days, now it's up to 12, just because they have this congestion to try to get some of this crude off the water and into uh, storage. But again, this is where we're starting to see some bottlenecks. So we expect uh, floating storage to continue to go up, specifically in China and Asia. And this is where we're starting to see that when you start uh, going through some of the different tankers, total number of VLCCs being used for floating storage is up five week over week, which is the highest since February 2nd. Again, that's something that we think is going to continue just given the issues that are happening at the Chinese ports. You know, when we start looking at road traffic, uh, I always think this is an important one to look at uh, as an aggregate. So China's uh, right back to where they were um, prior to the Lunar New Year. It's something that based on what we're seeing real time, it's going to start to peter out right around this level. And it, it'll it'll get back to 100%, not saying it, it won't. It's just it's not going to continue to go straight. It'll start to kind of flatten out and take a couple of weeks to, to get back to those levels. You know, the other issue that we're seeing is obviously the rest of Asia is continuing to slow or not get back to where they were prior to Lunar New Year, caused by an increase in, uh, in, in COVID cases in some specific areas, which we'll talk about in segment two, but also uh, with some of these price increases that we're seeing on gasoline, on gasoline prices and diesel prices. Um, Europe has started to roll over a bit, and we're actually starting to see some pressure come back into the European market in terms of demand, which again, we'll touch on more in the second segment, but you're starting to see some of these issues coming into the European market and North America is starting to flatten out as we go into uh, into March. Now, the U.S. will remain a stronger side of that. When we're looking at North America, we're starting to see a little bit of a, a headwinds and obviously crude, uh, crude prices going up, pushing gasoline prices up. Gasoline prices going up will start to weigh, especially as we start getting closer to $3.00 on regular and then if you're using anything above regular you're you're already well over three bucks so now that we look at that you know let's let's talk uh, about what's happened in the eia data so here you can see we had a big build uh 13.8 million barrels really driven again by pad three which isn't really surprising given the issues that remain in pad three uh, here, so Pad 3 had a, a build of about 15.2 million barrels. Um, the SPR, we actually just sold about 10 million barrels out of the SPR. That just happened, so we'll start to see some of that come out, but that'll still take time. But when we look at year over year, five year average, you can see that the crude uh, is now uh, about 46.6 million barrels over year over year and 27.7 million barrels over the five year average, all being driven really by uh, Pad 3. And in the comments, somebody had asked where I thought Cushing was going to be in the next four weeks. And I, my comment was higher because Cushing was going to struggle to, to drain down into, uh, into pad three due to refinery issues. And then the, the headwinds that we've been talking about into the export market, which again is keeping some of this crude stuck in Cushing. As you see the, the crude oil production up 900,000 barrels back to 10.9. This is something where, you know, the, the additional Delta, which for, um, based on what, what the EIA thinks there's about another 100,000 barrels to come back to market. That's again, that's going to be a little bit of a timing delay. I would say that it's, it's safe to say we're between 10.9 and 11. And so that delta is really not not too big. So there's not too much to come back, but we still have a significant amount of uh, refined uh, refined capacity offline, which resulted in these impacts that we've continued to talk about. 
Now, we gave that update on Friday because we thought some of this um, capacity of refining capacity was going to come back sooner. But then they had some issues on restarts. Uh, a couple uh, of refiners tried to turn back on. They had to turn back off because they had to adjust some things. So we're expecting that to adjust as we go through next week. This just puts into context just how sharp that move in oil inventory has been. And when we start, when we look at gasoline, you'll see that there's been a big drawdown to offset this big build in general. So these, these are things that we have to think about on that weighted side. But when we look at pad three, you can see that we're now back at that seasonally adjusted all time high. And just based on where the demand is going on exports on refined throughput, you know, refined throughput still isn't back to normal. It, it'll still take time. As we said, after the Texas freeze off, it was going to take over four weeks to get about 2 million barrels a day back online. That has now been adjusted to about 1.4, 1.5 million. So we'll get a little bit a little bit back on faster, but we're still going to see those impacts, which is going to put more oil in storage, specifically in, in pad three. Now, when we look at Cushing, you can see that we've we had that spike, and and as and as I was saying, that like we were going to get a big bounce, and then we were going to just kind of start going just sideways on on a on a gentle trajectory, if you will, up. And if you just look at the seasonality, we're just following seasonal norms. Like, you know, we had the, obviously the big shock after we had the refiners go down. And now we're just tracking the, 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 the general moves that we've seen, which again, if you just look from about the end of January till about the uh, end of April, beginning of May, we have a normal increase in, in Cushing build. And that's, so right now there's really nothing to say. Obviously it's, it's above where it, it has been since 2006. And we're, we're just tracking at a different level, which is what we've been saying, where we're following a lot of seasonal norms. It's just we want to look at what is the pace of change because we'd like this to be slower to get closer towards that average in general. But when you think about where uh, Cushing is in uh, overall, we're 11 million barrels year over year and right in line with the five-year average. So we're not too far off from those levels. It's just based on the refining issues that we're seeing in pad three. Those builds will will uh, will remain in uh, in Cushing over the next few, uh, few you know next week or two for the most part. And when we look at imports, uh, you know this is obviously a, a timing issue just as much as anything else. Uh, we had a small increase in Pad Three uh, that is going to accelerate. And then when we look at Pad Five, we had uh, that drop down that is set to reverse. There's some additional issues that have come into the port just in terms of getting uh, get, you know, offloading in across lo large parts of Pad 5, not even just you know, in California, which they're still trying to work through. Uh, pad 2, uh, again, that's just timing. Uh, so the ones that we're seeing the most increases in general is going to be across 1, 3, and 5. We should see this reverse over the next, uh, next week, especially as some additional com capacity comes back online in Pad 3. Now, when we when we start talking about crude uh, crude runs, you can see that we had about 2.4 million barrels a day of throughput come back on. You can see that we're still well off of uh, normal, and uh, that resulted in a 13 percent increase on utilization rates. That only takes us to 69 percent. We should be at about 81 to 83 percent. So just to kind of give you an idea of how far we still are from normal, you know, we should get another, let's call it 10 to 14 percent increase over the next three weeks. It's just now going to come in much smaller stages because the issues that are being fixed are going to take some additional time. And as we were saying last week, we thought pad two, that that was going to come back fairly quick. It did. Here it is now, which will also pull down a bit more imports. And we had about 1.957 come back online in pad three. And just if you look at year over year, five year average, we're still down by a, a wide margin. And some of that of that gap will close. We won't close it all at once, you know, we're based on some of the data that we've seen so far, it'll most likely be closer to about 5% to 7%, depending on how quickly and when this is recognized in general. And we're just getting some new data points for the physical market as things softened again, coming out of uh, uh, Angola, but we'll talk about that in the third segment. So now when we turn to implied demand, you know, as we as we were saying, we were going to get a bounce in gasoline and, you know, here here's that bounce. And it comes down to backfilling that storage. So as we were saying, we, there was 
all of these issues, you had to, you know, we had a big drop in, in gasoline uh, demand, and now we're starting to see that backfill. Now, that is also on top of we're still slow on getting those imports into the market, which is also going to adjust kind of where that storage is. So the demand in general is strong. It remains strong on demand in general away from the storm itself, you know, we're starting to see some pretty stable moves along seasonal norms, just given weather's getting warmer, people feel a little bit better. So that's going to start to increase some of that demand. It's just going to be a matter of, can we get back to some of those normal levels, which we'll talk about in the uh, second segment. And right now we still have about five uh, tankers hauling diesel, gasoline, and balloon components from Europe. Uh, they've changed course, so it's going to be interesting to see how what the margins are going to look like in general. So some are now going to Florida, some are going to the Caribbean, but you can see that the demand is uh, is still fairly strong. Disty, we're going to start to see that pair back a bit. This is kind of that last push, and then we start to see some of that normalization. As we were talking about in jet fuel and residual, those things normalized a bit. And when you look at propane, that's one that, you know, distillate gonna, gonna, is going to get that demand moving into the heating market. Then you're going to get propane, and you'll, you'll see those flip. Now, this is something where the next week we would expect to see a little bit of a, a pair back in gasoline and distillate demand and some recovery in jet and, and, uh, and uh, propane as we go into, uh, into the next uh, week or two. Uh, U.S. Gulf, as we were saying, we were going to come back within the bottom of the cloud on floating storage. How quickly this this draws back down is going to be depending on how quickly some of these refiners come back, which in general is just going to keep us at the bottom of that cloud with not much to uh, to show. And just given where pricing is in the international market, there's nothing that's saying that U.S. guys are going to look to to capture a bigger piece of you know, great pricing coming out of the Middle East or other. So there's this is going to remain uh, depressed as we go through the next month or so. And this is what we're talking about when we look at uh, imports. As we were saying, we, you know, we were going to get a bounce. It, we thought it might have been a little bit higher, closer to the top of the cloud last week. But then on Friday, we adjusted that just because there was some additional downtime that came into the market that was unexpected, which again, kept this capped. But we'll start to see this continue to edge higher, obviously not getting anywhere you know, back within the cloud, but again, closing some of that gap in the near term. And then when we look at pad two, as we were saying, we were going to come back to the five-year average, uh, you know, just based on where the demand cycle is, we're going to remain above the five-year uh, on, you know, we might fall below it next, next, uh, next week, depending on how this, this moves on a timing issue. But just based on what we're seeing, we expect this to remain above the five-year on average, and then uh, still stay at the top of that range. Not, not set a new seasonal record, but again, within the top of that cloud. And then when we start looking at the uh, the utilization rates, here's it gives you an, an idea of that sharp bounce. And now as we start getting closer to some turnarounds, you might get some of this pro, uh, some of this capacity staying down. But given where you know cracks are right now and where some of the shortages, which is incentivizing pricing for gasoline, you should see some of this come back as we normally sit between. 79 and 83 on on a general level when we when you think about uh you know pricing and and where where things are so it we're just going to go back to where we should should be on a seasonal norm and that's where wh why we're going to kind of sit at the bottom of this cloud as we go through uh april and may where we still believe that 81 to 83 percent is kind of the right number or the number that we're going to be at as we go into uh into not just the end of March, but also into April and then the beginning of May as, as we prepare for driving season to see what that brings, which we're going to talk about more in segment two. Mm -hmm. 